We will now call the meeting of the Waco City Council on April 2nd, 2024 to order at 3.04 p.m. Please join me for a moment of silence. Thank you. We provide an opportunity for the public to address the City Council on any agenda item or during the hearing of visitors portion of the agenda. On, a, um, on items other than public hearings, speakers will be allotted one three-minute presentation regardless of the number of agenda items the speaker wishes to address. If you're able to speak and have not filled out a registration card, please see the City Secretary staff at the registration table outside of the auditorium to provide registration information so that staff can contact you if necessary. If you have handouts, please let us know at the beginning of your presentation and staff will distribute those to council. If you're unable to approach the podium due to physical limitations, a microphone is available to be brought to you. Is there anyone present who would like to speak on a work session agenda item? Seeing no one is registered to speak, we will now recess the regular session and convene to work session with a report from our city manager. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. We uh, have a couple of changes in um, the procedure today, but no changes necessarily to the agenda that I wanted to highlight. First, I'm going to be calling the work sessions out of order, out of the order that's posted. Uh, and for your reference, we'll start with the, the Riverway project work session, then we'll move into the Eclipse, and then everybody's favorite project at the zoo. And um, at the end, if there's time, we'll hear from Jeremy Piscina in economic development on the the items that are on your agenda. If there's not time for Mr. Prasina, we'll move him into the business session at six o'clock. Second, on um, an update, I do want to have Assistant City Manager Paul Kane uh, discuss some potential changes to the water ordinance that's on this agenda this evening. And I'll have him hopefully do that towards the tail end of the work session. Again, if there's time. Um, wanted to give that ability for Paul to discuss that with you. Uh, since the ordinance has wide reaching implications on our residents and water supply. My only highlight today is a new staff member introduction, and I'm excited to introduce Amanda Dyer, who's in the audience. Amanda, if you don't mind smiling, standing up and waving. Yeah, she's... Uh, Amanda is uh, our newly appointed uh, division head over beautification, arts, and culture. Amanda's a familiar face to many in this room and certainly to the council. She previously served over at Creative Waco, um, where she led public art and grant writing efforts since arriving in Waco in 2019. She additionally has worked extensively in arts and culture throughout the state, including a, a stint at the Texas Historical Commission. I'm excited for Amanda to build the beautification program and get that off the ground. That was an important addition in last year's budget. So we welcome Amanda and and her talents to the city team. Thanks, Amanda. Amanda, welcome aboard. Um, we know you from your previous job at Creative Waco and are so excited for you to be on this team. I think that all of us have a deep um, passion, uh, me especially, for ensuring that as we try to do all of the things that we're trying to do in our city goal, uh, with our city goals, is, is to ensure Waco is a, um, stays and feels like Waco on one hand, and then on the other hand, that as we're doing our projects, it's a, it really creates beauty for our city. So. Uh, excited you're on the team. That, oh, that little delay on my mic over here. Uh, Mayor and Council, that concludes my report for today, and I'll take any questions on the agenda. And if not, if any no questions? questions, I'll call the first work session. That's great. The consent agenda includes resolutions 2024-200 uh, through 231. Are there any items Council would like to remove from the consent agenda? No council member Borderood has filed um, affidavits of substantial interest for uh, 202, 204, 205, and 206. So other than those four, the consent agenda will include um, uh, 2024, 200 through 231. And the next item on the agenda is work session item 2024-192. All right, Mayor and Council, we've got um, a great discussion. Team, y'all can go and come on down. We've got a a great group of folks joining us at the table on work session 192. It's a discussion of the proposed riverway development, which um, if you're a, a keen reader of the agenda, you'll note that staff made a, a mistake and put that that was in district one. It's actually district five. Um, so that was a mistake. <laughs> um, but no, it's a district five project that's uh, along the Brazos River and we've got 
representatives here today from CC Waco 521 Land Holdings. Uh, that's the Caldwell Companies. We've got Peter Barnard sitting to Sarah's uh, left, Sarah Roberts at the end of the table. Um, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. We're joined by Jennifer Ritchie, our city attorney at the table, um, as well as Julie Partain, our bond counsel. And last but not least, Clint Peters, our director of planning and development services. And then there's a chair in between them, not because they're mad at each other, <laughs> but rather because I'm gonna join them for a few minutes towards the end of the presentation. So excited for the council to hear more about this um, project and particularly using a new tool called a municipal management district. It's not new to the state of Texas, but it is new to us. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter and Sarah for an introduction. Okay, well, thank you very much for having us. Uh, we have spent, Sarah and I and our team, have spent a lot of time with your staff working on a project that we are really excited about. I think it's gonna be great for the city of Waco and uh, just hopefully be an icon and something that'll stand the test of time that many of us will come back to and look at. So thank you very much for your time and committing the resources on the city staff side to, to help and make this a reality. Um, I'm sure you guys have probably seen that picture before. I don't think we took that with the drone, but um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful track of land. So, so just a little bit about Caldwell Companies. <clears throat> um, I have been with uh, Caldwell Companies for 23 years. Uh, it was started about 33 years ago by a gentleman by the name of Fred Caldwell in Houston, Texas. It's a, it's a family owned, privately held business. Um, and, and we love developing really cool places. That is just a real passion of ours. Um, and you'll see just up on the screen there, just some quick you know, um, highlights on things that we've done. You know, we've been at this for a while. Um, 15,000 lots, um, 12,000 acres, multifamily, both, uh, both uh, active adult multifamily, build for rent, commercial, and some really iconic spaces that I'll show you some pictures of here very shortly. So just some of the people on the team, as I mentioned, Fred is our owner. Um, and and uh, I think a really important thing to note on this slide, and feel free to read bios and whatnot, is that everyone you see up there, with the exception of Dan, who's here with us today and is new to our team, uh, the senior people on our team have been there for an average of approaching 20 years. And that's really important because we'll talk about this a little bit more on this project, but um, it takes time to develop these. It's not just a, it's not a two, three year deal done and we're out. It's, uh, there's a lot of effort that goes into this. Um, one of the most iconic projects we've developed in Texas called Town Lake has, it, has had its 20th birthday this year. Uh, my, my youngest daughter was born 20 years ago, so we always link those two together, but they're, um, they have a life of their own. Just some quick awards and recognitions, um, not to brag or boast, but it, 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 does, it, it feels good when your peers call you out, and we've been called out many times in a good way um, throughout Houston and other communities where we've developed projects. So just some, uh, some highlights and some pictures, logos of some master plan communities to do, uh, that we've, uh, we've built, just to give you guys kind of a sense of the, the scope of what we've built. Um, we built from 2,400 acres, almost four square miles, down to you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 acres. So we've got the breadth of having developed very large, very complex, long-term projects on down to you know, very you know, unique and quaint neighborhoods. Um, all primarily within the northwest corridor of Houston, uh, with one exception in uh, we've got a project called Mission Ranch in College Station. So we've Town Lake is one I want to hit on because I think we've learned so much in Town Lake that I think it, it would benefit you guys from, or benefit the city of Waco on this project. All we've learned about water. And so I had a, um, the head of my grad school when I graduated, um, when I presented my thesis, he said to me, he said, Peter, follow the water and you land on your feet. And I have really heeded that advice. And this, this one took it to a whole new level. This was a project that was dead flat Katy Prairie land that we built a man-made 300 acre lake out of that took us 15 years to build. And it is, um, it has won all sorts of awards across the nation. It is, um, the tagline is a community connected by water. And, and I really feel like some portion of that vision and that tagline is really gonna be what Riverway will be to the city of Waco. It's gonna be a community intertwined with all the 
amazing uh, attributes that the Brazos River has, the park system has, um, and it's just, it, we're, it's gonna be a, a community connect, connected by the Brazos. That may just be what it is. Boardwalk is a, just a sampling of a, um, a very unique commercial development opportunity that we built within Town Lake. And it really ended up becoming very much the central focal point and gathering place um, outside of um, recreation centers for people within Town Lake. Um, and it was done in a suburban setting where a lot of people said we couldn't do it. And, um, and it turned out just beautifully. And as you can see some of the pictures on the architecture, um, it's uh, well attended Friday nights. We hold 42 events there every year. And it's just, um, it's, a fun, it's a fun place to hang out and a great asset to the community. So uh, this is the, the site location right here. This is a 520 acres bordered on the west by MLK and on the north by Lakeshore Drive and on the south by the Brazos River. Uniquely, a very large tract of land very close into a community. So whether it's Waco or any other city, it's just very rare to find this. Yeah, the vision, as I talked a about a little bit about earlier, uh, that we have for this is, is really just, you know, leveraging the natural beauty that this tract has on the river, taking advantage of you know, activating the community through connections by water, uh, creating a marina that will, that, that will allow people to recreate on the Brazos and, and you know, move all the way up and down the Brazos down to the stadium and, and all the new, um, the new venues that the city is creating on the water right now. Um, this is a concept plan, very briefly, that, uh, that shows that on the, the corner of Lakeshore and uh, MLK, there'll be a mix of uh, commercial and multifamily, and then in the heart of the track, there'll be various and different types of um, single family offerings. places that we'll make within there and recreation centers. Trails are a huge part of what we do. Um, it is, you know, if you look at the, the, the statistics, number one amenity in the entire 30 years I've been in this business across projects is trails. So we do trails really well. We've got a firm that we engage that, that uh, comes in and does a master plan for all of our trails. We've had many discussions with st city staff on, on these amenities. Just some more fun inspiration pictures of great outdoor spaces. Home architecture will be varied. Um, it's uh, you know it's going to be an eclectic mix of a lot of different you know themes and styles of architecture that just really kind of harken back to home. Um, you know har, har, you know hardy siding things that are just just feel soft and warm. Some craftsman elevations right here we'll, we'll sprinkle in. So then just a high level. Um, so this is a big this is a big project. It's a big project for us and it's a big pro it's an aggressive project for, for Waco. So um, it's 521 acres, you know, 2,000 residential units, about 1,100 of those are single family right now on, on the current plan. Um, largest master plan community in the, in the heart of Waco. And I think it's important for you to know that you've got a partner that is very passionate about this and that, you know, this is what we do every day, you know, from myself to the owner of the company and people on the team. I mean, it's, we, we, have, a, we have a tagline and it's something that we filter everything, every, desi every design decision that we do on projects. And it's like, is it going to make someone's life better? And so that, that's at the heart of what we do. And that starts from the top in our organization and goes all the way down to anybody who's executing on a project. Is it going to make a person's life better? So high level, um, $620 million plus or minus of projected taxable value at full build out, $102 million in public infrastructure. Um, something else I, I, I didn't mention earlier, but I'll, I'll mention right now is that Every single one of these large master plan communities that we've developed over the years have been developed in aid with different public finance mechanisms. 
they can be TERS, they can be MMDs, they can be MUDs, they can be, other, they have a lot of different names and acronyms in the state of Texas, but they just, they just don't, they don't make sense without that, without the uh, financial partnership of one of those financial uh, or public finance mechanisms. Um, so we've got two different uh, portions in there, TERS 4, and I'll let the staff get into more detail on it. TERS 4, the increment uh, retain, retained through TERS 4, and then we will also be creating a uh, management, a mun municipal management district um, to assist with some of the incremental costs as well. And I guess we're going to wait, we're going to hold questions until the end. That, that's up to council. Okay. <coughs> Keep going. We'll jump in with questions as we have them. Council, we're going to give Ryan a chance to change out PowerPoints. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, you've just heard from the developers of the proposed Riverway development. Um, staff wanted to pr provide you some context and background. As, um, as Peter uh, stated, if approved, this would be the first municipal management district in Waco. Um, the first part of this presentation will kind of be a municipal management district 101. I know that when we first started working on this deal, this was the first municipal management district that I would have been working on. And so part of this presentation uh, is to help me get it, get it in my head. And so hopefully it will be helpful to you all as well. Uh, Bradley uh, introduced everybody at the table, but I want to reintroduce Julie Partain, who is sitting to my left. Uh, many of y'all know Julie. She's part of the Bond Council team that has worked with the city for many, many years. But also, Julie is, uh, works on complicated economic development projects, both for Waco and all over the state. So to give you a couple of examples, she was outside council for Arlington on Cowboy Stadium. And she's also, what is really relevant in this situation, um, she has worked on municipal management districts um, all over the state. And so even though I'm going to be handling the first part of this presentation, the muni uh, Municipal Management District 101, she may jump in when you will ask a question that goes too deep and beyond my knowledge. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Julie to talk about the deal points for this deal. And then, then Clint will talk about the uh, proposed zoning. And then finally, Bradley will wrap it up with um, the financials. So as was mentioned, the developer is going to request the city consent to the creation of a municipal management district. And as was mentioned, this development's mixed use, but the majority of it is going to be single family residential. So um, you are familiar, Council, with muni what's called municipal uh, utility districts or MUDs. And so you heard Peter refer to MUDs and MMDs. Uh, MUDs are located outside the city limits. Uh, what's proposed today is not a MUD, it's a municipal management district, which can be only located inside the city uh, with the consent of the city. So unlike a MUD, an MMD requires, um, the statute that creates this mechanism requires that the developer have their bonds approved by the council or their five-year budget. And that five-year budget is what they base their bonds on. And so that consent and the consent to the MMD means that city can negotiate all kinds of deal points, including deal points on design and density that can be very beneficial to the city. And so as between those two, we view municipal management district to be the preferable um, <coughs> mechanism. So again, what is an MMD? It's a political subdivision of the state. So what we are in fact doing is consenting to have another political subdivision operate in our city limits, if you all approve this. They provide water and sewer improvements to a defined area. They can levy assessments for certain public improvements in that area. So I'm going to analogize that portion of what they can do to being a PID. They have a list of certain things they can assess, um, assess uh, for. They can impose impact fees. They also can issue general obligation bonds to fund road, water, and sewer with an election by the residents. They may annex land, but they don't have eminent domain power. They can levy a maintenance and operations tax if it's voted on by the property owners in that MMD. So why would you ever do an MMD? Um, when the area is developed, as you all know, and this happens in all kinds of developments, the developer is supposed to fund the infrastructure. Upon MMD establishment, the MMD can issue bonds and the developer can recover their infrastructure investment through those bonds. 
Their general obligation bonds contained an unlimited tax pledge. As y'all are aware, um, how much we can bond out is limited, but it is at least legally limited, uh, unlimited for the MMD. They're obligated to tax the residents in their district to pay these outstanding debts. It's created by the TCEQ administratively. It's governed by a board of directors, and Julie will later talk about the board of directors proposed for this MMD. And a director on the board of directors must own land in the MMD. Again, I mentioned this earlier, the MMD must obtain city approval for every bond issuance or um, for a capital improvements budget every year. And that capital improvements budget kind of gives the parameters for what they can issue bonds for. Uh, TCEQ must improve their bond issuance for water, sewer, and drainage, but not for roads. And the MMD ultimately can be dissolved by a vote of its board, by petition of the property owners, and by city dissolution. But if the city dissolves the MMD, all the obligations become our obligations, including their debt. So I'll turn this over to Julie so she can talk about the particular deal points. Let me scooch this over a little bit. All right, again, Julie Partain with Bracewell. We've been working on the Riverway Development Agreement, and so we wanted to give you sort of high level what the business deal points are looking like at, at this point. If you have any questions, we can take those at the end. So as Jennifer said, the developer is going to request the city consent to the creation of MMND. You would have to pass a resolution that consents. That resolution goes down to the TCEQ. TCEQ won't create the MMD unless the city provides them with a consent resolution. The basic deal point is that the city would contribute out of TERS 4 um, 70 percent of the tax increment generated by the MMD property to the development. Now under the terms that we're currently working under, the city would begin to retain some of that 70 percent starting in year 2030, working its way up to 20 percent in 2037 and beyond. So there would be some annual retainage out of that 70 percent starting in 2030 going throughout the life of the TERS. Um, under the terms of the agreement, the tax increment cannot be terminated this, uh, by the city, primarily because the MMD is going to pledge that tax increment to their debt. They're going to issue unlimited tax general obligation bonds, and they're going to have a double, what we call a double barrel pledge. They'll pledge their unlimited tax and the TERS increment that comes over from the city pursuant to a contract. Um, why do they want to do this? Because it lowers the tax rate the MMD would have to levy for their bonds. It allows them to issue more debt sooner, which means the developer gets paid back sooner, which in theory means it develops faster. It also would keep the tax rate reasonably low in order to market the development to um, home builders and home buyers. So the cost are at the back, and I think um, Peter mentioned it, is $102 million. Now, we can go over that. The current deal point allows for an increase of 20% overall of that cost or 10% per line item without approval of the city. Anything above that would have to go specifically back to the city to be approved. You'll see that the improvements are kind of your standard, roads, water, sewer, drainage, and parks. Pretty basic. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, there would be they want to pursue the capital improvements budget option, which would mean they submit every five years a capital improvements budget to the city, and in that would be their planned bond issuances, and you would approve that. Um, the deal point now is that, again, similar to um, their overall cost, they can make changes to each five-year capital improvements budget but can't exceed the overall cost by 20% or any category, road, water, sewer, drainage, by 10%. Any escalation above those in the five-year budget would have to be approved by the city. Um, the city would waive impact fees, but um, in lieu of that, the developer will make two $1.5 million payments to the city, one upon the first building permit issued for vertical construction. The second one would be three years after that, and that money would be available for any lawful purpose by the city. It would not be tied to this development. Um, the MMD board would have five directors. The developer would submit names to the city. The city has the ability to reject. They would work together to appoint the directors. At least two of those must be residents of the city of Waco. As far as the improvements, the water and sewer improvements would be immediately dedicated to the city and be part of your system. The road improvements would be held by the MMD for 20 years and maintained by 20 years and then dedicated over to the city with a grade of at least 80 on the city's pavement management system index. The parks would be owned and maintained by the MMD, but they would be open to the public, all residents of Waco. 
This development is large, 521 acres is a large development. It'll probably take more than 10 years to fully develop. There is a phasing plan in place um, for 16 phases, and the first phase would begin about 18 months after you would approve the agreement if you approve it. Um, the city and the developer have also been working through a design book as part of this process, and I think Clint's gonna talk a little bit about what the development standards are planned to look like within the district. I'm going to hand this over to Clint. All right, so I'm going to uh, go over the, uh, uh, the development regulation and zoning strategy uh, for the development uh, to carry out that vision that uh, Peter was talking about in his presentation. Uh, it's, it's structured very similar to the Floyd Casey uh, development where we have, um, there we go where we have a uh, base zoning uh, set up. Uh, the majority of the property is currently zoned uh, R1B, which is our standard single family zoning. And then there's a small strip of C3 zoning along MLK, which is our general commercial zoning. Uh, this map shows that what the proposed base zoning be for the property. So we maintain uh, the R1B zoning for the, the majority of the property, which is about 430 acres. That would be for the single family portion of it. Uh, and then you, uh, the C2 zoning, uh, which is our mixed use commercial zoning that allows uh, commercial and um, multifamily uh, would be that red area, which is about 60 acres. And then R3B, which is a low density uh, multifamily would be uh, used for uh, the moderate density residential. Uh, and then the second part of that is creating a, an, an overlay district for the, the full development um, that would have a design book uh, that would guide uh, design regulations for the whole, whole, whole development. Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the total maximum unit count for the development would be almost uh, eight, 1,887 lots, uh, which is actually less, um, even though it's going to be a, a mix of housing types. It's actually less than what the uh, current zoning would allow. If you just developed it all as single family zoning, 50 foot lots that are allowed in the R1B zoning, you could get up to close to 2,200 lots. Uh, and, and a big part of this development, what makes it uh, unique and, and such a great thing along the river is that it has 31% of the development is uh, open space or amenity areas, which is about 160 acres of the development uh, with over a mile of river frontage that, that was real important with the developers in the city that we maintain that open space. Uh, we'll have sidewalks throughout and trails throughout that connect the development to the river and then uh, high quality development standards uh, including facade variation and diversity requirements, uh, density and product type mix, uh, building height, massing, placement and material requirements, uh, porch requirements, reforms and materials, uh, windows and doors, uh, circulation plans with street sidewalk trails and lighting design and the signage requirements. Uh, there are four types um, of housing product that are identified in, in the uh, overlay and design book. Uh, the yellow area is our single family and that includes two, two types of what we're calling traditional in estate neighborhoods. The traditional lots would be range in size from 40 to 60 uh, feet wide uh, with a max uh, unit count of about 880. Uh, and then the estate lots are 60 to 80 foot, uh, potentially larger than that. And on those, we put a minimum requirement that will be mixed in with that of 75. So we do want to have those, uh, a minimum of those units in there. Uh, and then the, the modern density, which are the uh, orange areas on the map, are zero lot line, townhouse, brownstone product, uh, with a max unit of 232 units in those areas. Uh, and then finally, the multifamily, which are the, the brown section of, of those, which is about 31 acres, uh, with a density of 23 units <coughs> an acre, uh, which is about 700 units total. Uh, and that's, that's an overview of, of how we structured that. Uh, we'll get uh, more into the details of that as it goes through Planning Commission and back to City Council uh, for approval of that overlay. Uh, but just wanted to give you an overview of what uh, we're looking for uh, on the uh, zoning requirements. Would you hand me the keyboard? Mm -hmm. 
So Mayor and Council, we wanted to show you all that um, the proposed timeline for this. Um, the TIF board is scheduled to meet on April 11th to consider um, this would cause an amendment to the project and financing plan to add Riverway and the, and the money to the plan. Um, then on April 16th, we, Council would have a public hearing in the first reading of the ordinance to amend the project and financing plan. On April 23rd, Plan Commission would have a hearing on the rezoning and the overlay. On May 7th, 2024, there would be the second reading of the ordinance on the project and financing plan, a resolution to consent to the MMD, that's the resolution that Julie referred to, a resolution to approve the development agreement, and a public hearing for the uh, rezoning and overlay. And then finally, on May 21st, 2024, Council would have the second reading of the rezoning and the overlay. Council, I hate to do this to you, but I need to take like a five minute break. Great. Thanks. Good. We'll close the meeting for a minute. I'll be back yep. in a few we minutes. We will have a um, recess at 3.35 p.m. We will um, reconvene the meeting at 3.41 p.m. Mayor, thanks for the, the delay there. Um, the team here gave me the role of doing one slide. <laughs> and I got cold feet. <laughs> no, just making sure that I had it right. Um, so I'm going to close out with a summary of the project economics, particularly regarding and TERS for public infrastructure reimbursements and project revenues. I won't be covering the MMD side of it, so you'll notice some, some differences between a number that's been quoted at 102 um, that I'll show you here in a minute. But the cleanest way to do this is to compare, to me, to compare the site's undeveloped condition as it sits today to what's been proposed by the Caldwell team on the river, Riverway development, and then show the public what the city revenues might be and what the TERS 4 revenues might be. Um, I've also included potential reimbursements to the developer based on the staff's draft agreements. As Jennifer noted earlier, those will be considered at future meetings by the TERS board and ultimately by the city council. Before I get going, um, the stuff you're gonna see on the slide, you know, none of these are gonna be perfect down to the penny. Um, there's some caveats or variability that I want to talk to you about. And you probably remember the old quote that's attributed to Mark Twain uh, that there's three kind of lies. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> well, projecting revenues on a project of this size with a lot of variability in timing and market variability certainly would make even the best statistician, statistician a liar. So my point is there's some variability to this that will likely shift the revenues and reimbursements to the developers. For instance, for me to run numbers on this project, um, we're going to show the taxable value at uh, $620 million. Um, and we're going to show that number on the Performa carrying all the way through 2051. Um, that's a post-construction number, $620 million. Well, what, what we know about the way the market works is there's going to be appreciation between 2037 and 2051. And so likely there's going to be some positive uh, influence on the revenue number over that period of time. But we stuck with a 620 number because it's what we know today. Another variable I want to mention to you is we've based this performa on our current tax rate at uh, 75.5 cents and the county's current tax rate, the community college district's current tax rate. But what we know is that all three entities over the last few years have been dropping their tax rates. And that could, over time, produce some, what I'll call kind of negative pressure on the performer that I'm gonna show you. Because I, I fully expect over the next few years we'll continue to try and lower our tax rate. Um, additional variability is in, actually in, built into the agreement with Caldwell <coughs> currently that's been referred to as um, you know, the reimbursements can vary based on project cost. The development agreement with the developer doesn't necessarily include a reimbursement cap like we normally see in our charters agreements. Um, it allows for variation um, kind of on a five-year capital improvement plan, some variation that it can go up as construction cost estimates go up. And that's something the council will review every five years. <clears throat> this 
of course, was required because uh, the project is a multi-phase project, and it's going to take years, if, if not even a decade or more, to build out, and it's, in, it's hard to estimate constru construction costs over that long period of time. That could put negative pressure on some of the revenue numbers. I think the negative pressure I'm talking about, referring to on construction cost escalations, will likely be significantly offset by the first factor that I mentioned, the setting the uh, taxable value at 620, that's gonna go up, and the cost may go up as well, but they'll, they'll kind of keep each other in check. Again, significantly offset, likely by, the, by that appreciation that I mentioned. <clears throat> So let's walk you through two scenarios. Um, I'm gonna do one on the left and one on the right. That's some, here it is, hopefully. There it is, okay. So today, on my left, we have what the project, or what the property is currently valued at, $527,000 is its taxable value. It's sitting in ag status, that's why it's so low. And from 2027 to 2051, that's gonna generate the city's general fund about $123,000 if it were to remain in an undeveloped condition. On the right, you have what the Riverway and the Caldwell team has put together, um, a great project, clearly. Uh, $620 million is what we ran the performer based on. Again, we kept that level across the whole 25 year period. <clears throat> that would generate $29 million to the city's general fund through 2051. That's a cumulative number. It's not a net present value. It's a cumulative amount of money over the 25 year time period. You'll recall that when we set up TERS 4, the reason there's an inflow to the city's general fund is because we set up a 70% a TERS 4. So we do retain some dollars in the general fund in this TERS as the increment grows, and that $29 million is reflective of that 30% that flows to the general fund. In addition to the $29 million I mentioned, the city's general fund revenue, the total estimated revenue to the TERS 4 from this project is estimated at $112 million. That's that third line on the right. Approximately $93 million of which will be reimbursed to the Caldwell companies through 2051, providing a estimated approximate retained revenue for TERS 4 that it could use for other projects between 2030 and 2051 of $19.5 million. As Julie referred to earlier, that repayment schedule is light on the TERS 4 side in the early years, meaning there's a small amount of money in the early years to the TERS 4 for retainage that will grow towards the back end of the term of the agreement. So that 19 is not spread evenly across 25 years, rather it's smaller on the front end and larger on the back end. <clears throat> Make sure I've covered everything. So kind of to help, help us simplify it, about 83% of the TERS for revenue generated by this project will be given back to the developer over time in the form of reimbursement. And that would be combined with the MMD revenue to support all the public infrastructure required of such a project. A couple of things that I did not do, I tried to try to get this down to like one slide, easy to condensed, easy to look at it simply, but a couple of things that, you, that I did not do is I've not accounted for the upside of general fund revenues after 2051 for a couple of reasons. Because, I mean, you know, the TERS will eventually go away at that point, and all the revenue would be coming back to the general fund. And it's a sizable amount of money, but that also is in 2052 when I'll be 70. <laughs> nothing wrong with 70. But nothing, <laughs> amen. Kind of young when you think. <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with 70. And in fact, I looked it up. That'll be... Uh, we'll have a full solar eclipse in Florida that year, so I'll probably be in an RV chasing a full solar <laughs> eclipse uh, in Florida. Um, so I have not accounted for that, A, because it's far out. 
Um, the other thing I've not done is analyzed other development scenarios that could occur on this property that may or may not require the amount of reimbursements that are proposed in this agreement. It is conceivable the property could develop in a few different ways. Um, still, I think it'd be an exercise, a lengthy exercise, likely in futility, to venture a guess at the what, when, and how the property would develop. Um, so I've not done that. So I've given you a left and a right. I've given you what we know is happening today on the left, and I've given you what's in front of us with the team at Caldwell on the right, trying to boil it down into a simple look. And that was my objective, and hopefully it's helpful as you get to deliberate the public policy behind such a move at this point. So we'll take any questions from the council uh, to any of our team members that are here at the table. I want to jump in with a, a quick question that I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the structure of this right, because that $112 million does seem significant, and it, and it is, but am I right that the way that this has been structured is that, or sorry, the $93 million and the $112 million, but the $93 million um, reimbursements over the 25 years are only from the increased tax revenue generated from this project. Said differently, I know that this has been described as an eat what you kill incentive structure. So the reimbursements for the infrastructure and incentives come from the property taxes generated on this site, the increased property taxes generated on this site. Is that correct? Yes, the tax increment from the site. Now, true, the city money will be the increment generated from the property. What they, what they put down in value, they'll get back. Obviously, the MMD will levy a tax. Yes, the MM, MMD right. will, which right. is not what I'm trying to clarify, I think, and I think it's for the, important for the public to know when they see this number. I think it's important for the media rep reporting on this to, to note and report to our constituents that as we consider this incentive structure, um, that the city is not taking money, pools of, um, from a city street fund or the police fund or um, from our water budget or even other TIF four projects, that this incentive is going to be reimbursed to the developer out of the increased property taxes that this project itself will generate. Is that right? And I just think that that, you know, headlines can throw people off when they see the city is contributing this amount of money. That doesn't mean that this, we don't need to go deep, ask questions, have a robust policy debate about this issue. I think we do. But I think that that's an important clarification for, the, what, for this particular structure because sometimes people think that you're taking money, we're taking money from... Um, increasing support to our police department or funding someone else, someone else's city streets for this project, and that's not the incentive structure that we're talking about here. Correct? Yep. Correct. Mayor, may I add a comment there, too? I do think it's also important that um, because this is the first special district where bonding and that type of reimbursement is being made, um, there's, there's, there's also the fact that the developer is funding the construction, they're funding and constructing it, and the taxable value has to be realized and sustained for a period of time before those reimbursements can go out and be bonded, because they're going to be underwritten just like a city's bond would. So there's a level of kind of at risk, if you will, that the project's successful or the reimbursements don't occur, um, because there's nothing to come to if the, if the um, houses aren't absorbed and the construction activity doesn't actually materialize. No. It's good. So I, go, I, I, go ahead. I was like, go deeper on that as far as timelines. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question. question. You know, what that looks like from, I mean, because I understand that the developers are, are absorbing that burden, the initial burden of the, I mean, which is what you do. Um, right, right. <laughs> but so, help me understand about, yeah. So I think, I, I don't know if it was Julie or Jennifer, I can't recall which one spoke to the phasing, but uh, it mm -hmm. was mentioned that there are multiple phases in this project. And so if you want to think about the reimbursement structure, it kind of marries the phases, right? Okay. So if you, uh, the, the first, I think in the projections, right, if you start construction, we were hoping to be done a little bit earlier in starting construction, you know, very first part of next year or early or end of this year. But if you did that and you have houses on the tax rolls, 
um, that are completed in 25, right? You wouldn't really be in a position to, to float your first reimbursement until probably 27. Um, and then you would have tranches of repayment as additional houses come on board. But each, you know, each, each year or so after that, they're, they start out a little bit small and they get a little bit bigger in the middle and then they kind of stabilize towards the end. And I want to say there are probably 10 years of that, years. roughly. It's so it's not, you know, it's not a one time of that. You, you have to mm -hmm. sustain the success with each phase of the construction for the model to work. But you are paying for everything up until that point. Uh, well, you're paying for it, yes. Correct, correct. yes. Until, yeah, that's correct. And I know, I think, you know, we're not voting on this tonight. I know council can have questions. We can look at spreadsheets and go as deep as council needs to, to get clear on this. It, it is um, an aggressive incentive, but it's also an, an, a unique opportunity that we're facing to have this number of um, single family homes be um, placed in proximity to our downtown. And I mean, when we look at our housing plan, and we look at our goals for downtown, it really is a unique opportunity. So I, I, I'm not trying to stifle questions from council right now. Ask, this is a great chance to ask, ask away. We got outside council and developer and the dream team on our city staff all at the table. So great, great time to ask questions, but also if you, um, between now and whenever that calendar is of, of when it comes back to us, there'll be opportunities for us to go as individually as deep as we want to with staff to make sure that um, we're really clear on the implications of, of this model. So I'm, I'm familiar with MUD, um, uh, but so MMDs are, are, are there, it's, a, it's, a, it's taxed like those are, and it's just an additional tax that those homeowners will pay, <laughs> but those tax dollars then go back to the upkeep of said infrastructure within the MMD. How is that different than a HOA? We're used to HOAs here. We're not a, used to MMDs right. here. Is there a? It's actually fairly, fairly similar. I mean, us as a developer, we're going to have to we're going to have to sell that value to someone. It's like you're going to live in a nicer community, or everything's going to be you know, with different standards needed. Things are because of it. There's going to be an incremental tax. Mm -hmm. It's going to be it'll, it'll feel similar. It's a, the, the HOA is that we know there's HOAs all over Waco. Yeah, where people they have, have. They have plenty. Yep. But they don't have to come to us for them. Right. 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 But they don't have to come to us for them. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Clint, the only, I don't know if it's a question or just a comment. I don't want to be, with my development, I say mine. <laughs> come on. Floyd Casey. Come on. And this one. I don't want uh, the city to be put in any kind of position that they're going to have to think, well, which one are we going to fund? Which one are we going to help? Which one are we, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think, I think that from a funding perspective, this, what I think, and again, we can get with staff and, and talk about it, but from a funding perspective, this incentive structure, that, that's how this is structured. They get, they get their incentive out of the taxes that their deal generate, so it can't compete. It won't compete with other funds. Now, from a market- You heard that from the mayor. <laughs> it will not compete. No. From a market perspective, I think, you know, the other thing is we can look at our housing study to see the demand yeah. for okay. housing stock. And the other thing I would say is that Floyd Casey, I believe, is gonna be a good bit ahead of this development in terms of coming online from a housing stock perspective. Uh, I've got another question. Let me- Clint, well, go ahead. Go ahead. You have on the tip uh, timeline that you're going April the 11th to ask for funding, or why so soon? Why why are we doing it? I mean, we're just not talking about this, but April 11th they're going to go before tip. We're we're attempting to be very responsive to the developer's request. But I'll, let, I'll let Sarah speak to that timeline. Sure, I, 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 we've had that application in since November. Um, well, and, I didn't know that. Right, and I would say our goal has been all along was to be in a position to break ground this year. There, this is a super, it's a big project. It has a lot of, of nuance that has taken a long time to work through. And so um, 
we, we frankly were hopeful that we would be on an earlier TERS agenda and there were, there were just some delays um, that were unforeseen. Um, and so we're trying to make up for that time and be able to still hopefully be in a position to move forward by the end of the year, early next year. Um, so um, we are, it, it may seem short in window, but we've, we've been working on this, I think for 18 months with staff and, and are ready I'm to close it out. I'm glad you have been, but I, I, I was not aware of that. So that's why I asked that question. Thank you. Um, the, um, oh, Bradley, you were gonna respond to something. Yeah, there were, there were two questions that I thought were really, really good. First one on the HOA versus MMD, I do think it's important to say it, it is, it will feel like, to Peter's point, it will feel like maybe on the ground, they're similar, but in, from a statutory standpoint, mm -hmm. the MMD operates with very similar powers and authorities to a city. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't pay your MMD bill, there's very real resolutions that can take place by the MMD that, that maybe a HOA doesn't have the ability to do. The second thing I wanted to highlight on um, Councilman Rodriguez's point about making sure that Floyd Casey still has its funding model and TERS for, and we're not turning our back on that. That is all true, but it brings up a very important point that TERS for, and you'll hear a little bit later from Jeremy Pacina on another TERS for project down in the industrial park district. We have lots of projects loaded up in TERS for, lots of big projects. And as Sarah talked about value coming on the rolls, that has a very real impact on us for TERS for, for perspective projects, the next set of projects. It won't hurt the projects we've already necessarily approved, but as people come to me for TERS for support, it, I will need to see a, another tax roll, for instance, or two before you'll see another big project in TERS for, um, because we gotta get some of this stuff underway and on the rolls and, and see what the implications are to TERS for. So I thought that was a good question and a, an opportunity, opportunity for me to say that publicly that um, that's where we're gonna be in TERS for. And that because um, I, I get that that's how it plays out. But if it is a eat what you kill deal where the increment is generated uh, or the, the incentive is generated from the um, increased property taxes that are collected. There's, yeah, there's if there's other projects that come on and are proposed, it's not like this pocket of money if since the incentive is from so I get. I, I guess I explain that to me how if this is only going to be incentivizing the deal, the um, out of the the property t collected collected from the boundaries of the the project, how does that put us in the red for other future projects? In the red. What it does is so the obligations that we set up on the industrial park deal, Floyd Casey, this deal, each of those require some amount of coverage because we could have variability in one or two taxpayers in that district that we can't control that result in negative pressure on the overall fund. It doesn't change a Floyd Casey outcome. It doesn't change a Riverway outcome. What it does is create overall pressure on the fund. And we have a couple of property taxpayers we're adding to TERS for that are bigger than towns around us from a property tax value standpoint. Uh, GPI for one, and it's in this district. And variability, especially on the commercial side, can produce lower revenue numbers than anticipated, which could impact our ability on future deals. And I'll feel better in the future for other projects if we can get a tax roll or two down the road before we structure another large project. Agreed. It's about coverage. Agreed, but when it comes to this project. It doesn't change this project. Your, your comments, eat what you kill, are correct. I just thought Councilman Rodriguez's point is, 
is it was looking at Floyd Casey assurances on Floyd Casey and what I'm what I'm pivoting to is the next Floyd Casey or the next big project I will want to see a tax roll or two before I put another big project in front of you and for it the will need also big is what what's that I said for the cheap seats big you consider big what yeah, that's a good question. I mean, big has gotten a lot bigger these days. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it really has, which is good. We've we've got a lot of great opportunities. Um, it will just it will feel it will feel like the responsible thing to do to create coverage requirements so that this can continue to sustain itself over time. Um, and this may be a Julie question. Um, they mentioned in your intro. Uh, Cowboy Stadium. So was Arlington involved? Um, I'm, cities that have done this before in this way, can you talk to me more about that? Um, Arlington has an MMD called Viridian. You probably heard of it within the boundaries of the city. It was on a 2,000 acre piece of land that had never been developed in the city. It had some serious and expensive drainage issues related to it and they couldn't find a way to do it otherwise. So they did create an MMD, but this was back in 2009, I believe, and they did create they uh, they created it by special legislation. It has some additional powers that um, a riverway wouldn't have being created under the statute. Um, the city does give a portion of their tax. They give a tax increment over the county participates, the college district district participates and I believe the hospital yes the hospital district participates same structure though um, I think th I think that's where all the MMDs these days are getting their ideas from Viridian because <laughs> um, it's a double barrel pledge right so the the district issues bonds backed by their unlimited tax but they use the revenue that comes over by contract from the TERS to essentially buy down that tax rate essentially it's what it does it allowed the developer to issue more and sooner um, Viridian is probably going to be built out in, the, in less than five years, and um, I think the developer will be fully reimbursed from the amounts that were voted, that the district voted, probably in another two to three years, which is pretty fast considering the first bond issuance was in 2011, and then it took four years before there was enough value to do any more. So um, that, that is the one I am most familiar with. That is that model. And they do have a development agreement between the city and the district, like we're envisioning here, um, that sort of put some <coughs> guardrails around what the district was able to do. That has been successful. I think it went from, I think when it was vacant land, it was maybe $6 million. And now it's, um, oh gosh, don't give me the line. I, I want to say it's really close to a billion now, if not over. Thank you. That's great. Um, I am so sorry, but I forgot your name, sir, uh, from Caldwell. Yeah. Peter. Peter. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come down here and, and present this to us today. Um, and staff, thank you for putting together uh, your end of it. It's all um, hopefully really, really well received and, and super informative. Um, Peter, you mentioned during your presentation that sort of a guiding principle for you guys is uh, asking the question of how does this improve people's lives? This is not a gotcha question. There's not a right answer here. Uh, and I, I've got an inkling as, as to uh, what you may even say, but how does this here and, and now, now being the proverbial now, between now and the next 10 years, improve lives uh, of Wake Owens? So how does this? Yeah, this, this specific project. So, as you're asking yourself, getting ready to, to, to move forward with it. It's a, it's a similar theme for you know any community project. I mean, it's like you know, the things that make you feel really good about a project is when you when you drive into it and there's things that you've spent hours laboring over the design decisions and creating and and trails and the many centers and you and you drive through a community and there's an Easter egg going, hunt going on. And there's you know 600 kids there. You know, those are things that fill me, that fill my soul, and I think most of us on, on that team. But it's just making people's lives better. Yeah. And, you know, connecting people in the community, you know, getting people out of out of their homes. That's, that's something we focus a lot on. Like in, in Town Lake, we have over 200 lifestyle events every year. And what that means is we have a lifestyle team that's all they do is they wake up every day and they figure out, how am I going to get you out of your home? How am I going to get you, you know, out of your backyard and, you know, and around your neighbors and in community with each other? Because I just think that builds healthier relationships for all of us long term. So it's not, it's not, it's not going to be different probably for Riverway than it is for a lot of other projects. I think that similar theme just kind of permeates what we do and what we love to do. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely agree with the idea of, of getting people around their neighbors and, and 
uh, out of their homes and into community is, is better for all of us. Um, quick point of clarification, the uh, funds generated by the MMD as serving as the de facto HOA as we've uh, uh, established here, that pays for a lot of the lifestyle uh, events and uh, staffing and things like that. Probably no. It's they're actually hard, you know, hard improvements. Okay. But, Great. You know, most of the uh, like you know, in similar where we've got different, uh, different, different public finance me mechanisms. You know, the mud district or management district might pay for water, sewer drainage, detention, you know, roads um, to a degree. But you know, the lifestyle events now they're they're taken care of through HOA dues. Awesome. Uh, and then just a couple more. Sorry. Um, I am always caught in the tension as a public servant of uh, new development being exciting, and, th and this is very, very exciting, especially providing connectivity along the riverway and, and the, the public access there. Um, I'm, I'm always torn between the excitement of that and then the reality that uh, new development is a great way for cities to generate cash uh, quickly, but uh, typically leaves us with uh, a lot of money left to pay out in infrastructure in the long run. Um, and, th and this deal is structured in a way that I feel good about. Uh, it's not that, th that, that is not what I'm getting at. Uh, I, I'm really just stating this to say that, um, you know, if, if there was a run on municipalities like, like there was on banks uh, in the Great Depression for infrastructure needs, uh, every single city besides maybe 10 in the country right now would be uh, belly up. And so I'm always caught in that tension of, uh, you know, what can we generate for long-term infrastructure needs versus what are we giving up to provide the object that generates that? You know, in, in this instance, it would be uh, this potentially really beautiful uh, development and community. So uh, I'm just stating that. That is not uh, a question, but, it, but it, is a, it is a real reality that is being weighed at least by one council member in terms of, you know, what, what we are setting out to do and, and also what obligations we have otherwise. Um, so, and then I guess lastly, I would say, or sorry, two more questions. One will be kind of quick, I think you can answer it quickly. Uh, in my really cursory research of uh, municipal management districts, um, it seems that for infrastructure needs that you guys are responsible for during the duration of the time you're responsible for them, uh, if they arise, you have an election to levy uh, some sort of tax to pay for that, is that correct? Correct. I would assume it's a formality. Most people want infrastructure where they live and it's sort of just a part of the governance of it. It's not. Uh, so in the event that you host an election, it does not pass and there's this clearing infrastructure need, does it just stay that way or, or who foots the bill that, on that? You want to answer that one? Well, that's all done at the very beginning. So all the elections for debt and the election for the maintenance tax would happen when there's very few people out there. Oh, great. Um, so you, you, you would only have it that one time at the beginning, and they generally don't have another election in their life. That's the point of clarification I needed. I wanted to make sure it wasn't a recurring election situation, sort of like with uh, individual bonds and things like that. So, um, And I might have forgot my last thing. Oh, I remembered it now. Um, and this is another one that is not a gotcha question. I have an inkling of where you're, where you're landing on this, and it is more to get it on the record. But is this deal viable for you under any other cost and reimbursement structure? And I'm I'm not coming at this from the standpoint of you guys are asking for too much. I understand that if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. You can't do it. Uh, I just want to uh, be crystal clear moving forward as we prepare to vote on this. Um, so large, large projects just generally don't make sense yep. unless you've got some sort of a public finance mechanism. You can look just outside of Texas and you, you can look at you know, states in the United States that are home to the best master plan communities. They've all got a public finance mechanism. Yep. They look different, they call them different names, but they all have them. And, and it's, you know, in, in the absence of this, what would likely happen to a project like this in Waco or another market and, you know, is that you end up having small communities developed over time. Because the burden of getting that private, you know, those private finance, financing sources versus having access to a public debt market, it's just, it yeah. makes it cost too much. And you can't, you can't afford to do the things that everybody loves yeah. and, and make these communities special. Yeah, and um, council member, if I can add to that, I think one of the interesting things for this one, I mean, the numbers are obviously so big compared to what any of us, I mean, somebody who lives here as well, are used to seeing. Um, <clears throat> 
and projects of this scale really, um, that the public finance piece is really part of the solution and utilizing all of the different tools. I think the interesting thing that, you know, when I think about why I work on a, with a project like this and be a part of a project like this, to me, if Waco is going to begin dreaming big for these things, it's doing it in places that have more of an impact than they otherwise would. And for, for you know, a mud, you could run 20 miles outside of town and come seek consent and levy the same amount that you're gonna levy in the combination of the MMD and the TERS. Um, but the opportunity for Waco to figure out how to do this very complex thing on a piece of property that's so close to the central business district, to the surrounding core of the city, and can really hopefully be a, an impetus for surrounding developments and, and helping the city reach its goal of bringing new homes into the core of the community, into yeah. the heart of the city. To me, if you're gonna try to do the first largest master plan community that the city's ever seen and use some tools that we've never done before, it's an opportunity to do it where it's gonna be way more impactful than if you're running way down any highway we want to name, right? Um, and so I think that's part of the thing that we get excited about when, in, in, in talking about this. It's been a very complicated journey to get here, but we're hopeful that it isn't just the vision of the Caldwell team, but it also helps the city achieve some of its vision as well. So. Yeah, that's a really great way to say that. I appreciate that. And I'm all for uh, any number of people we can get into these uh, at least beautifully rendered homes uh, <laughs> near our city's core to uh, spend their time and their money downtown, especially with the big plans we have on the horizon for downtown that we're going to need bodies in place for. So uh, I appreciate all of that. Um, Peter, you've been uh, more than gracious in answering all of my questions. Thank you. Um, Holmes here. Uh, Peter, that great presentation and team, great presentation. Um, lot to love about this thing. I mean, this is... Uh, big project called will your quality uh, partner the principals in this uh, deal are just great I, mean, I, I know a lot of the folks that, that uh, are, are putting this together um, big project 500 acres of, uh, just going down the list a marina uh, the, almost 2,000 resi units uh, a big part of it in op uh, open space green space which I love uh, so 22 acres of commercial so and, and this is in a part of town that's kind of been hibernating i guess forever you know we, i think there was some talk about this being developed 25 years ago and just it just hasn't happened uh so i like the fact that uh a big part of this is housing stock which we do need and um, it puts these residences down uh, residents downtown closer to downtown it's just two miles but it feels even closer than that um i'm not i'm, I'm kind of like a council member barefield i'm pretty familiar with the MUDs, but I need to still study up on the MMDs, uh, so I'll, I'll do my own research on that. If you have something to send to me, uh, uh, let me know. Um, uh, and, and on this one, I guess, I say eat what you kill, but it's really the, the city is sort of cash neutral, is what I'll say, because as the, in one way, because as the value is built up by the developer, the, the increment becomes larger, but the increment is basically pushed dedicated back to the developer for these for all the improvements that that are coming in here so i would say i guess it's eat what you kill but it's more like you know if you're going to build it if you're going to build the value there it's either worth like on this slide up here it's either worth five hundred thousand dollars or 620 million you're going to make it worth 620 million so the cost that it takes to get it there um you're scraping out of the ters increment basically, if I'm understanding it right, Sarah, that's... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yes, I think the, the, the benefit that comes back in the form of reimbursements at 93 million, if you do the TERS retainage at 19, the city component, as well as the county and the, and, uh, the community college who are also collecting theirs, I think of the entities participating, there's 72 million going back to the general fund of those entities and or TERS four in the same period of time that that 93 million is coming back. So it's uh, definitely one where there is more going to the developer, but there is a tangible net benefit to both the general fund and the TERS for both of those entities. Um, the model that was talked about in Viridian, for instance, there a hundred percent of the TERS goes to that development. It's 85% is of the increment goes to that development. 
from the city. I think it's lower for the other taxing jurisdictions. So it is a, this is a deal structure that has some net benefit improvement over some of the models that are out there in the state. Um, and then the improvements, I don't know if this is just the wobble factor in putting the models together, but we're, we're talking about 102 in one, and then this is 112, or is that just interest carry? Or? Yeah, so the 112 is actually the amount of revenue that the development will generate in TERS 4, so just in property tax taxes, the 70% of the property taxes that goes into TERS 4. Um, because I'm the comparing it. I'm, and, that it's more than, I'm comparing it to the 102 to the 93, yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So the the um, as you can appreciate, the actual reimbursement is not the full 93 because they are through bond issuances. So there's the debt cost. So like the principal portion of the reimbursement between the MMD and the TERS is is what equates to the 102 million. But the 93 is a component of that. Okay. Um, then there's no, and I guess the other part, and, and this is just me getting more familiar with the MMDs on the, are, are all the roads, drainage, water, sewer, park, all, all this built up to City Waco uh, infrastructure stand, standards, basic building standards, um, nothing more, nothing less? Well, hmm, that's a very good question. There are some site-specific um, modifications that we have proposed that I would be glad to document in a memo to council mm -hmm. over time. Um, a, some of those are developer preferences. You know, we have a developer out of Houston that has some preferences uh, related to street standard that I think we completely understand and are on board with. We also made some modifications to drainage given the proximity to the river. But I'd be happy to document those for council. Great, thanks, Bradley. Um, and the other thing, I just again, I need to get more familiar with it. But the the five year CIP budget, it's every five years we we. Like, I guess I'd want to know what does the first five year budget look like? Is that is that available? Give the number, and I'll let Julie talk about the mechanics, if that's okay, Julie. It's seventy million in the first five years. So as you can imagine, the early infrastructure, we're not looking at the map, but the early infrastructure includes some of the really large arterial roads that are more expensive to build. Um, and so there, it is front loaded in the amount of expense that the developers putting in. Um, that's part of the reason the public finance mechanism is so important because if you're putting in 70 million in the first five years and in that five year period, you're selling maybe 300 of the homes, the revenue to expense doesn't work. That's where the reimbursements become so critical. Sure. Sure. So, so the, the deal points as proposed right now have, when y'all um, consider the uh, master development agreement, y'all will be approving the five-year budget as part of that master development on the, agreement. On the, very front, the first five years, sir. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, then the last little comment that I have, I mean, the, the, we either, there's two ways of looking at this. I, mean, I know that uh, resident, oh, there's a thousand ways of looking at it. What am I saying? There's at least two ways. Uh, uh, we could either, uh, residential is kind of achieving what we want. Residential near core, I think, is, is important to, to the city and to the council. Um, you, could, you could either do this at an organic pace, I'll say. You know, you'd have some hodgepodge building, most likely, uh, you know, 10, 20, 50 acres at a time. Um, and it probably wouldn't, you know, uh, uh, it wouldn't be quite as cohesive of a project, obviously. Um, and it would take time to build out, and it would, uh, we would always kind of guess, well, is that 527 going to kind of, when is that going to happen? 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Um, so I would say that an organic pace would allow... The good part of the organic pace is the fact that we, the, the city would keep the, the TERS or, or maybe a larger amount of the TERS increment. Uh, so that's, I guess, the weight, the, the balance we're trying to figure out here. Uh, the master plan community, I think, has a lot of benefit to it because we kind of we know what's going to be there. We can kind of have a look at it as long as we can kind of contain costs. These are big numbers. Um, and and I, I wish there were ways to phase this in where we could take a little bit smaller bites, but I, I see that's not the ask here. That's the that's this is what's on the table. Um, so anyway, I think this is the way we're, we're we're weighing it. At the end of the day, I like the top number, 620 
is a lot nicer than 527,000. Uh, um, and, and the thing I had kind of lost along the way as I was thinking about this, and Bradley, I'm glad you pointed it out, was the 30%, you know, that the 29 million there, or all the 30 million, uh, is what we would drag in this that's not part of the developer reimbursement portion, which is not immaterial. But uh, anyway, give, giving us some stuff to think about for sure. And then we'll have the model sort of refined a little bit more before we talk about this again, possibly, question mark. Well, I think the wheels are, we wanted to come here, obviously, for work session and review. But to meet the timeline that, that um, city attorney outlined, this is about where it's going to be. We've got to get docs going and TERS board meetings. And this is about... I mean, I, as the mayor mentioned, I'm, I will sit down with each member, go through the spreadsheet, but this is about where it is given the timeline that's proposed. Okay. And in that in that one-on-one -on -one and sit down, I want to also look at what the guesstimate of increased city services will be. You know, because that's the thing. I mean, you're however many, how many homes? It's uh, 1,800 units, 1,100 are single family homes. Yeah. We, um, we do and, have a, and the MMD does have the maintenance on the streets, drainage. Um, for for 20, five years? For 20, 20 years. 20. 20 yeah. years. And okay. parks. And Sorry, parks, parks, too. Parks and, and trails. trails. But only obligations on maintenance um, or water and sewer. And then, of course, there are some other city services you're alluding right. to Fire that we'll be providing. Absolutely. Um, which will be, is why, you know, I think the council was real wise to do a 70%, 30% TIF. Mm -hmm. Because that's a real that's a real cost. Mm -hmm. I guess it, Any other questions? Thank you guys for being here. We appreciate everybody's work on this. Call the next work session from here, and then I'll make my way back up. Um, we've got a briefing from Jonathan Cook on the Eclipse preparations as our next work session. And um, you, I kind of gave Jonathan the, the marching orders to make it a party, and he decided to make it a really big party. <laughs> so excited for the council to hear about that, as well as a, a temporary art installation um, that's in progress. Um, That'll be a fun addition to the weekend as well. So, Jonathan, awesome. thanks for the time. Thank you, Bradley. And tough to follow that, but but I just keep thinking about on how do I make that transition to a totally different subject. The councilman Barefield just said it. I mean, Big has a different meeting now, uh, <laughs> and it's true. And here in Waco, what we're doing is that bar of excellence. We've set that, and that's not only in the developments that we make, but in the experiences that we create for the people coming to into our city. So I need to get a keyboard real quick. Can't just blank it with your mind. I mean. That'll be next year. Hey, uh, <laughs> we do want to start, and obviously, as we're near the eve of the eclipse. Uh, over Texas, the excitement continues to build. And uh, I'm very pleased to report that city staff, uh, along with representatives throughout the county, uh, we're clicking on all cylinders right now as a multi-phased approach to hosting this eclipse. And what is really is we know a once in a lifetime event here in Waco and really trying to capitalize to create this experience. Um, we're going to be looking really quickly at some of our planning efforts that have been in place, some up to two years, but obviously quite heavily over the past uh, three to six months. Um, looking not only at, at those efforts throughout the weekend as far as the planning, what weekend events we're going to be offering, not only city produced, but those community partnerships as well. Um, we're going to take a quick look at the status of all the plans for the Monday event, which is taking place at Touchdown Alley outside of McLean Stadium. And as Bradley mentioned, I also want to give a preview of a temporary art installation with some local artists uh, that's going to be visible at the corner of University Parks and Franklin at Indian Spring Park. This is a map that we're all familiar with seeing, and I think I got a little numb to it. 
And then all of a sudden, as I was reviewing this, it just hits home. And it starts to hit home when you see it in the national news and the maps pop up. There, there's perhaps no more ideal place than where we are situated along this corridor of where the eclipse will be passing through. And uh, it doesn't take long, and I'm starting to play the license plate game. Uh, and there are multiple <laughs> license plates starting to pop up. I saw a lot of cameras so in town last week. And so the excitement is building as we're seeing, uh, you know, a flood of people coming to our area uh, to take part in this solar eclipse event. A lot of behind the scenes work, as I mentioned, and that coordination starts with our assistant city manager team led by Ryan Holt on the emergency management side of the team and our emergency manager, Ryan Durker, um, and working with Waco Fire, uh, Waco PD, Texas Department of Transportation. First and foremost, uh, you know, ACM Holt often says the word situational awareness uh, and making sure that we have the protective measures in place to where if any type of situation does arise, we are able to have resources in place and that reaction time is there. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it is definitely not preparing for the worst, it's preparing for the greatest events that could happen and having those resources in place. We're going to be having an activation of our emergency operations center uh, beginning on Friday um, and as we know uh, you know multiple camera feeds throughout town to monitor traffic uh, multiple uh, assignments <clears throat> from different law enforcement making sure that everything is flowing smoothly with these uh, not only just within traffic but then also events around the city um, it is truly a team effort our, our uh, weekly meetings have grown uh, multiple departments and aligned too long a list it's not just about the events uh, not just about the tourism, it's about the resources as well, fleet facilities. Uh, the list is long on the departments that have worked on this. Um, and I, I just go back, it's everyone coming together for that true City of Waco team effort. It makes me think of whether it's a national championship parade or an Ironman event or uh, you know a presidential or a, a politic rally. Like we come all together uh, to make sure that uh, from an emergency action standpoint, we're ready to go. Um, I, I want to hit on, obviously, when you're doing the planning and, and uh, preparation, uh, there is that magic time of when we start to look at that 10-day forecast, uh, and we can all guess and, and question the weatherman, uh, but now we're starting to hone in on what the weather is looking like, and uh, obviously when you're talking you know, a solar eclipse or any type of solar, uh, we start looking at, at clouds, we start looking at rain, and, and what are the opportunities that we have? A good thing about with our experience with large-scale events is um, the emergency action plans address these weather contingencies. Um, and this can include everything from wind, lightning, rain, uh, and different measures. So uh, for the weekend concerts that we'll be having, uh, we do have contingency plans and inclement weather. We often do, con every year we do concerts in April. So no stranger to those plans at a familiar location of Indian Spring Park utilization of the convention center. On the Monday event, you know, it is a ticketed event, and there are a lot of questions as people are beginning their travel plans. Well, the what ifs, what happens? It is a rain or shine event, um, and one thing I, I really want to focus on is, yeah, it's still going to go dark, uh, and so there will still be natural things happening, but what if you can't see the sun? Well, fortunately, we have video screens that are going to be located throughout the event. And we've been working with our partners with Discovery and the NASA uh, group. NASA is going to be broadcasting the eclipse. So you will see the sun on the video screens. It will also be uh, broadcasting crowd coverage. Uh, they have over 11 million YouTube subscribers. So obviously, when you start looking about that, that's one of the reasons, and uh, City Manager, Assistant City Manager Lisa Blackman, when we came with the name of the event, the Live from Waco, we wanted to really show that aspect. And so it's not just about at the event, it's going to be broadcast, and you will be able to see the solar eclipse. If for some reason it's not visible from Waco, we will be broadcasting at the event site as well. So uh, we're excited, rain or shine event. I look at it always, I'm an events guy. So if it's saying a 30, 40% chance, uh, you know that 60 to 70% chance we're gonna be all good. And so it's spring in Texas and we're ready for whatever the weather might bring. Jonathan, on that uh, point, should attendees out there be prepared that during the totality 
even if it's a cloudy day, it's going to get pretty dark out there. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. And in fact, I was at uh, doing a walkthrough at Touchdown Alley and assuring uh, a lot of those lights, they're, they're sensors, and, and you know, off of the daylight. So even the lights, we're making sure that the lights do not come on. So you're able to soak in the entire experience of that. So the totality does mean there will be darkness as well. Yeah, they were talking about that in the Convention Visitor Bureau meeting. Um, one of our representatives, our commissioners, is a bailiff. Yeah. And so they were like, yeah, we've got to make sure that we um, get the timers down. It's almost like the sprinklers during the fireworks show. Yeah. So it's things it's that we happening. have to make, make, make contention. Yeah, we've learned And the lights have come on. So we're, we're going to be bringing, and that is something, because... Um, you know, it's one of those things, and I have not experienced the solar eclipse myself, but I also, you know, there is a, a, a quietness that will often come over the crowd. You know, it's a natural event, and so we're looking forward to that, um, to just to soak that in and really take in that this is something special that our community is able to commemorate. I want to go real quick and uh, give a quick preview uh, of our weekend event strategy. Um, and, and as we mentioned, um, we wanted to capitalize not only on, on the people, obviously, uh, lay out that welcoming doormat to people when they come to our town. And an interesting thing that we're seeing in sort of the demographics of numbers that our hotel says, we're expecting, you know, a lot of people have never been to Waco before. Um, so th there is that idea when we're looking at a weekend festival concept of creating something memorable for the people who are coming here. But then that's also for our lo local community and, and people traveling in uh, to maximize hotel st stays as well. As you know, uh, you know, we elevated our Brazos Nights concert series for this weekend to where we went with three straight nights of concerts that will be free to the public with some national acts that I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but really at the heart of it, it is really, you know, we know the economic impact is already coming. We wanted to take that to the next level. Um, a couple interesting notes I'm working with Dan at, at the CMB <coughs> that I want to hit on that economic impact and some of our demographics we're seeing is that we do have confirmation that people will be visiting from all 50 states as, as well as eight different countries around the world that we know of. We know it will be more. Another thing that we're seeing and hearing from the hotels, the reservations are not just for that standard average of about one and a half to two people per room. It's more tipping that three and a half range. So more people staying within the hotel rooms. Um, and one thing, you know, our, our occupancy rate is uh, up over 90% for the weekend, especially on that Sunday night. Uh, we've been um, aided with some rooms that have come online. I know with the Even Hotel, um, but what we've seen, Houston has long been the number one uh, place from destination of, of people traveling. Obviously, they're not in the line of the eclipse. And up until uh, we really started pushing our, our concert entertainment out, we have California, Arizona, uh, Washington, all of the other in the top 10 are non-Texas cities. What we've now seen, though, is that DFW, Austin, and San Antonio, we have seen a spike in, in those over the past couple weeks. To where they're now getting close to the top 10. So that's affirmation that what we're attempting to accomplish here with the concerts is working. Um, and the bottom line is in looking at the dates from last year as far as revenue brought in from April 5th through April 8th. Uh, we're nearing a 600% increase in hotel revenue and then a 400% uh, percent increase in revenue on our short-term rentals. Uh, so it's very interesting. Uh, uh, Dan and Carla have done a great job in tracking some of this information. <laughs> Uh, but what that lines up is for a great weekend of concerts and uh, you know when you're planning concerts it's always a, a big push of mine to have a wide range of artists that, that appeals to different styles of music but then it's also you don't have to be a music fan to come out and enjoy. Uh, but on April 5th, on the Friday night, we will be having more uh, in the country and indie rock vein, uh, Band of Horses and Lucas Nelson, both national acts that play large festivals. Both uh, Band of Horses will be traveling right after our show for a very large festival in New Orleans the next day. That Saturday, April 6th, uh, uh, Journey Through Hip Hop Night uh, is what we're tagging it as we have... Uh, 
uh, the MC, big boy of Outkast, uh, you know, the greatest rap selling album of all time. Uh, they were responsible for multiple hits that we know. Um, also DJ Z Trip, and DJ for LL Cool J and known for mixing different styles. He's uh, you know, only person, it's crazy, he'll mix like a Nirvana song or even Rush, like Tom Sawyer over hip hop beats. Uh, really cool what he's able to do in craftsmanship on the turntables. And then uh, Arrested Development with multiple hit songs from the 90s, Grammy winners. So excited to have that night. And then finally we'll be closing it out on April 7th with the Pure Country Night. We figure with a lot of people traveling in, uh, it's stereotypical, but you can't go wrong with Texas country music in Waco. And so we had the White Yoke Loma, up and coming artists, Caitlin Butts and Ty Myers as well, to round out our three nights of concerts. Jonathan, on behalf of Waco's Gen X community, I just wanted to give a big shout out for 90s Hip Hop Night. I got, a, I got a, some text messages from uh, a Baylor University dean and some, some members of the bar and just some others that are pretty pumped. <laughs> Uh, about 90s hip hop night. So appreciate us taking this leap. I think this is going to be fun. I only had a couple years. I feel to pull it off to where then I'm going to be aging out maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and, and so Jonathan, you, you hip hop it. just turned 50. You'll be all right. <laughs> you so, uh, need be... to get away from the age stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, thumbs up again. But, um, so we are excited and uh, no doubt, and once again, I want to stress, uh, you know, security plans in place. We understand it'll be a lot of people, but then also for our local community, uh, we are expanding our layout of the end of spring or Brazos Lights concert footprint. Um, so we're looking forward to that uh, lineup as well. Um, I will mention we will start seeing street closures uh, in front of Indian Spring Park starting tomorrow afternoon. There's some equipment already being placed. We have to have everything fully set up uh, by Thursday afternoon. Um, uh, those are the events we're working on, but even a, a little bit more, not just about music. I, I definitely want to highlight the work that Region 12 has done with their Steam Clips Expo. It's going to be taking place Saturday at the Waco Convention Center. Uh, upwards of nearly 100 different booths and activities free to the public for kids awesome. and families throughout the convention center. We'll have food trucks, people can grab lunch. Uh, excited about that one and then also the work that the Sports Commission has done. I know registration is now over 400 participants uh, for their Glow Run 5K that will be going along the river. This will be taking place, obviously it's got to be dark for a Glow Run, so it's going to be taking place at the same time as some of our concerts. So runners will be able to run, come back, enjoy the concert. <laughs> They'll be starting out um, at the intersection of University Parks in Jefferson and running into Cameron Park. So uh, a lot of action going on on that evening on the Saturday night. Um, and then on the Sunday night, uh, really termed that, that lights over Waco. And um, one, it is the concert. We have a little bit of an earlier starting time, but we're estimating at about nine o'clock, uh, we'll be having a walking lantern parade that'll uh, feature. You can make lanterns um, at the event. You can make lanterns this week at the different libraries. Uh, they're doing lantern uh, programs, making programs. Uh, you can also bring a flashlight. You can purchase a glow stick. Uh, we're encouraging everyone in a walk of unity of some sorts uh, to where we're going to be crossing over the suspension bridge and the Washington Bridge. And so we're looking forward to that. As that walking lantern parade ends, we will be launching a drone display over the Brazos River. Uh, similar, we did this for the first time last year with the opening of the uh, reconstructed uh, suspension bridge. But obviously we have a lot of different solar displays, a great soundtrack to go along with this. We also have 300 drones. Uh, that technology keeps advancing. So uh, really excited to have that. We expect that to be at 930. And um, as I mentioned, we'll be following up uh, with the eclipse over Texas on the Monday. I definitely want to mention Waco Art Center's also help at the Lanterns Parade. Citywide, it's um, all departments are offering different things. Uh, the events, obviously, on Monday is a huge focus, but uh, Waco uh, Wetlands will be open in different events, as well as our libraries, our Waco Mammoth National Monument already expecting. They'll have huge crowds out there and some telescopes. 
events at the zoo or community centers or working with NASA representatives as well to make sure they're giving uh, presentations on Friday um, and then uh, making sure that everybody's stocked with solar glasses to really take advantage of this event if you're not going to be at the Monday festival. On the Monday Festival, uh, tickets have been uh, continuing to sell quite briskly. In fact, the numbers uh, need a little updating there on approximately 10,000. Uh, that's more push to uh, probably just over 11,600 total tickets sold. Uh, that includes VIPs that have sold out, general admission. Uh, another 1,700 tickets have been sold with parking. Uh, obviously some complimentary tickets here and there that have been given out through various avenues through the community. So we are expecting an attendance of upwards of 15,000 for this event. Be taking place 10 to 4 p.m. with the eclipse taking place at 1.30ish, I believe. So you go out there to uh, Touchdown Alley at McLean Stadium uh, we've got vendors out there, so we've got food trucks. Will there be music out there? No music at, no music. at this point. Maybe some background music, but I'm glad you brought that up. Um, if, if you can sort of visualize a July 4th celebration with vendors along the river, about the same number of food vendors. Cool thing about this, though, is you have a steam zone uh, where there will be hands-on activities. Uh, you also have public telescopes and stages to where you're going to have presenters uh, with the scientific background talking about different aspects of the eclipse. Uh, but like I mentioned, the telescopes to where anyone can go and view the sun with the sun filter on it. So a lot of different activities where, yeah, there are stages <coughs> and presenters lined up. Um, so it's a scientific festival, uh, but also a celebration to come. So I love the way it falls at that lunchtime hour. We encourage people to get out there, get through the gates, get a food and lunch, and get your spot set up. Um, so that's the lineup of events that we have. Because it opens at 10 and then the eclipse begins sometime after noon, is that right? Correct, and I'm going to show, I'm going to fumble this, but is it 1.30, uh, 3? 1.30. 1.30, okay. Oh, sorry. Well, really quick, we, we uh, another, I mentioned the experience, you know, and different things from the steam zone to the Monday event, the music. Uh, where was the art piece falling into all this? Uh, and one thing that we started, I want to mention, in Indian Spring Park, you're going to see um, a project where 21 trees are going to have different colors of LED up lighting oh, in cool. them. Uh, to create that light experience. Uh, but even more so, we were, were contacted by Creative Waco and, and their team uh, in regards to a couple of artists who had a project on display uh, um, down in Austin in a, a Greenway project and an art exhibit that we thought would be a good fit here in working with Fiona. And I want to take a second to talk about it. Um, local connections to the artists of, of Lucas Greco and Reeve Hunter um, and really creating a series of, of um, I'm going to say, of heads that are made out of natural material that talk in different languages at the same time. And it's called Babel. So what it is, is really we've looked at it, they've started some installation. It's going to be a four-week temporary art display. Uh, they are fully colored. They're uh, color-changing faces. This is a project that there was no cost. It was funded through Creative Waco. So uh, the water-themed poems, that were written by Wacoan, and they are translated into eight different languages. Wow. Um, so the point of this is we're attracting people from all over the world. It, is, it really signifies a celebration of different cultures and the diversity that we have. So if I'm not mistaken, we're going to flip to this next slide to give you a little preview of what you can expect. So these are about six to seven feet tall. This is under a bridge in Austin. Uh, we've got them in a circle area of Indian Spring Park. They're going to be on public display. So we're excited to, to work on that and, and have these local artists uh, committed to showing uh, you know, their work off. I think there's some meaning to it. And like I said, it's just another piece of the puzzle to creating that experience. I, I wanted to hone in on, on the site just for a visual reference. 
Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see a small red square that signifies the location. There is a berm on that intersection of University Parks and Franklin. This is down in a flat spot that has an accessible sidewalk around it as well. And this is a picture just from this morning. Uh, oh, cool. I wanted to give you an idea of what these look like at that intersection. Uh, not hooked up and talking just yet. Uh, they're working on that. But this gives you an idea of this temporary art awesome. installation. That's dope. It is. So Eclipse Over Texas, I said we're all excited. Uh, we're full speed ahead right now. I want to appreciate uh, you alls support to put on this event. Also, the support from city management and all the work from the staff and multiple departments. Happy to take any questions if you have on any of the weekend events or the Monday event. Any questions? No, great job, John. This is great. And Lisa, I know that you've done a lot of work on this, too. No be, questions. It'll be fun. Jonathan, no how long are the faces going to be up? A month. They will be up for the rest of the month. Uh, they will likely... Uh, and. and I'm, seeing, I'm thinking of the dates right here. Uh, we've got another Brazos Nights concert, our annual Cinco de Mayo event on May 3rd. So they'll be running right up to that point as well. Awesome. Thank you. It's awesome. Amazing job. Yeah, amazing. I mean, it is. Yes. So many comments are, you know, wow, Waco's really do. Y'all doing that in Waco? Y'all, I, I, and I have to tell the people, I mean, it's a city to what? There you go. I was like, see, you know, come on. Um, so, you know, but this is all great. I know that you all are working 90 to nothing and all the emergency staff and everybody that is involved, but we are incredibly excited and appreciative about this and once again, inviting the world to our home. I think it's just such a testament to the excellence of our team. Um, I want to thank Ryan and the emergency management team. Obviously that's kind of behind the scenes work, um, but I know we've gotten a briefing months and months ago at a, a city county intergovernmental meeting and have had some sense on all the work going on behind the scenes to ensure that we're prepared logistically and from a safety and traffic perspective. And I'm sure there'll be um, some you know, congestion and traffic issues that might um, come to be because of the influx of folks. But just knowing that we've been really thoughtful in that regard, um, is obviously of critical importance and I appreciate all the work done on that and then in terms of the fun um, that we're really here to talk about and celebrate today man it just this just shows the the level of excellence that our team goes to so Lisa Jonathan the entire team that has gone into playing this really thank you so much for taking it to the level that it's due um, I cannot wait to experience this I know our residents are going to benefit from it and have a, a lot of fun and it's going to showcase education. Waco well the educational parts too. Right. Yep. Thank you, Bradley, for having such an outstanding staff. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. We appreciate it. And any questions throughout the weekend, we look forward to see y'all let us know. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you, you, Jonathan. If y'all need any additional kind of vocal content for the faces, <laughs> just let me know. Just if you're looking for something, I think I've got some ideas. <laughs> if anyone can do it. <laughs> Thanks. Let's execute. Suffering to freestyle rap. I think, I think he wants to be one of the talking heads. He wants DJ Z Trip backtracking him. All right. Our, um, normally, if we need any voiceovers, you're the first person we call. So. <laughs> Just saying I'm available if needed. Uh, our next uh, work session council is going to be the, um, a project that it's pre-construction phase. Well, let's be honest. It was pretty bumpy. But now that we've gotten into construction, it is going so good. And I want to invite our director of the zoo, uh, Brendan Wiley, to come up and give an update on Cameron Park Zoo exhibits. Oh, we've got Derek, too. Sorry, Derek. Oh, no. My bad. Derek I'm Oltman, facilities director. He's, he's kind of the man behind it all, um, making sure we get there. But they're going to talk about the update on Penguin Shores, the Education Center, and the new veterinary hospital at the zoo. We are just a few short months away from cutting the ribbon and completing these projects, which is very exciting and wanted to hear, wanted the council to hear an update on the project. Mayor, members of the council, city manager, thank you for allowing us to be here this evening. It's truly an honor to be able to present this information to you. Also wanted to just say how great this work session has been. <laughs> I mean, it started off, we got to hear about a potential amazing new development right down the river from the zoo. 
And then uh, we talked about the, the eclipse and uh, one new piece of information about the eclipse you might not have heard of yet. Forbes magazine published an article over the weekend saying the number one place in the country to watch animal behavior during the eclipse, the Cameron Park City. Oh. I know that. Um, uh, there's three things that we're going to cover uh, over the next few minutes. That is an update on the Glory and FM Penguin Shores exhibit, uh, updates on the Education Center, the Carol and Dutch Smidhauser Veterinary Hospital, and then provide uh, an update on the budget and timeline for both projects as well. Uh, before I go to the next slide, some of you may be aware that a few months ago, uh, Carol Schmidhauser passed. Um, as such, uh, there has been some interest from Dutch to just name the hospital after her. So as that is to be discussed, we will continue to keep you updated. But first, Penguin Shores, uh, welcome to the Gloria and FN Young Penguin Shores. So what we thought might be fun to do is kind of take you through the project by comparing the current project status to renderings that you have seen in the past. This uh, project has been actively discussed since 2017, uh, but really this project is the last project of the original zoo master plan. So uh, something really to be proud of for the community, to be proud of uh, for uh, this council, for all of McLennan County. Uh, so the, the picture on the left shows that entry approach into the Penguin Shores exhibit. Uh, you see the two rondavels on the right in the rendering. You see those very two rondavels uh, that exist now uh, on the picture on the right. Uh, giving you kind of an aerial approach to the penguin exhibit. Um, you know, again, the picture on the left, a rendering from several years ago to what is physically appearing at the zoo today. Uh, that center area is the awesome. uh, Penguin Plaza event space. Buildings on the left include the uh, Penguin Life Support building, the Penguin Nighthouse building on the right. Uh, is the housing unit for the African black-footed cats. Uh, this rendering is one that people just fell in love with, the idea of being able to see the penguins swimming underwater. Um, and you see it in its actuality today. Uh, these pictures were taken mid-March. Uh, some of the glass has already been installed uh, the progress is just dramatic with um, typically on average about 40, uh, 40 contractors working daily. Uh, this rendering shows a view looking across the plaza towards the black-footed cat exhibit. And that is the building that you see in the background. Um, black-footed cats are extremely rare animals. Uh, there are 27 currently in North America. There's about 70 total managed in zoos around the world. Uh, we will be one of 13 zoos in this country to have this species, and it's an incredible opportunity for us to make significant dramatic impact that this species definitely needs. If you've never seen these guys, back to that theme from earlier in this meeting about uh, big is getting bigger. Uh, this is one of the smallest uh, cats, uh, but oh my gosh, do they have big attitudes. So, um, cute little tiny cat, just a little bit on the ferocious side. So kind of in summary on the uh, Gloria and F.M. Young Penguin Shores experience, uh, the Black-Footed Penguin <coughs> Habitat will provide a home for 22 black-footed penguins to start with. Uh, we are actually going to receive the entire black-footed penguin colony from the Fort Worth Zoo, uh, which has several advantages for us. Uh, number 
one, it's a mixed age colony. Uh, we will be able to just continue right into reproduction with that colony. Uh, there are birds that are already used to Texas, uh, so to speak, and we'll be able to send staff there uh, in May to get to know the birds that they will be working with uh, for, for years to come. Uh, we have already sent our marketing team there. You will soon see billboards on approaches coming into Waco. And um, those are the photographs that you see on those billboards are of the actual penguins that we'll soon call Waco home. Mm -hmm. um, the Penguin Shores Event Plaza, I think, will become the most desirable reception area in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also worth noting that this project will feature um, the zoo's first bathroom facility with adult changing stations in it. Um, the support space that's been developed, designed for the penguins is phenomenal. And um, it's also worth noting that shortly after this meeting, uh, the city secretary office will be in touch with your calendar with an invitation for each of you to come to the zoo to walk through these projects. Um, we're going to quickly transition to the education center and the veterinary hospital uh, using the same approach to kind of give you that update on its status. Uh, renderings on the left, actual pictures on the right. Uh, the one caution with these renderings is I don't know that they fully convey the scope of the project. So on the picture on the right, if you see the big lift uh, kind of in the center in front of the building, that provides a better reference for the scale of this project that is being built. So of the it looks like two buildings. They actually share a common wall. Uh, the building closest to us, that is the education center um, with a uh, kind of a prominent entry point, center middle. Uh, the road that will be parallel to this building will be the uh, bus drop off zone for participants, participants in uh, the various programs that will occur here. Uh, it was the vision of this facility to provide technology-equipped learning spaces. Uh, the key area in the building is one uh, ginormous education space that can be subdivided into four spaces. Uh, without a doubt, this facility will double the amount of programming we can offer right out the gate and probably triple our reach. Uh, also in the building is this gallery hall. This is the hallway that runs right next to the entrance where uh, kids and families will take this hallway to their uh, desired classroom. Uh, just outside the facility is the outdoor learning space. And in summary, the Education Center uh, provides four different technology equipped learning classrooms. Those spaces can be managed individually or combined into one. Uh, also with the outdoor learning space, um, equipped for distance and remote learning. Uh, this facility will also include holding space for our ambassador animals. Those are the animals that we take to schools that we use in our different demonstration programs. Uh, we'll have the gallery hall uh, provide support space with offices uh, to enhance the multi-use and function of this facility. There's also a small catering prep area and, of course, provides uh, bathroom facilities for our children along with a space for volunteers. Over the course of a year, we see about 10,000 hours of volunteer service, and this will be the first time that they have had a designated space to work out of. Uh, the back side, uh, just behind the education center, is the new veterinary hospital. 
and uh, I'm going to I don't know well this probably oh, so on the screen this is our current veterinary hospital right there um, the facility that's being built is just incredible. Uh, obviously, you can't take much away from uh, the status of this surgery room, but once I go to the next slide, it will help kind of tell the story of this hospital space. Uh, the layout was designed to really promote quality animal health and animal care, and the layout of the building essentially follows the progress that a animal uh, in, in distress may need. The surgery room is connected to a treatment room that's connected to radiology, that is connected to lab and pharmacy. So a wonderful design to really promote uh, quality care, quality health management, and to continue <coughs> to provide excellent care for the animals that live here. Uh, the, anim the veterinary hospital also provides holding space for both sick animals that are patients under our care and new residents uh, that are going under a quarantine procedure that is um, typical of new animals moving to a zoo. So the summary for this portion of the building uh, obviously, to provide that continuity of care, the treatment room, surgery suite, radiology, lab, pharmacy, and necropsy. Uh, we did a necropsy on every animal that passes as part of our standards of care. Uh, it also offers uh, quarantine facilities and uh, sick animal holding along with support spaces for officing and on-call veterinarians. Uh, this space also equipped with technology for distance and remote learning. Uh, just like you may see in a hospital, the surgery lights will have cameras mounted in them so that we're doing a, when we're doing a procedure on one of our animals, uh, others can participate in the learning that occurs there. Regarding budget and timeline, uh, this <coughs> essentially is the same budget that has been following this project that uh, this council approved. Uh, the top line, the total project budget for each of these projects uh, over the last year and a half, two years, uh, Derek has presented change orders to work through that project budget. Uh, both projects are on track, on budget, essentially projected to uh, have some savings, which will go to the final uh, project described by the bond proceeds, which supported this. Um, been great working with Derek. Uh, if you ever need somebody to be critical of a contractor, <laughs> you call him, he's going to. He'll, he'll, he'll do the squeezing. Uh, timeline, uh, Penguin Shores is, so both projects are projecting or progressing incredibly fast. Uh, they are active, active project sites. Uh, what I should have mentioned about this budget, just going back to the slide one more time, is that uh, just like some of the pictures that you're seeing, uh, this budget is from roughly around March 11th, uh, but although the numbers have changed in the last two and a half weeks, uh, the end result has not. Uh, still projected to be uh, on track, just under budget. Uh, timeline, we are estimating that we will be hosting and inviting all of you to a grand opening, a ribbon cutting, uh, hopefully in early August for Penguin Shores. And then about six to eight weeks later, uh, we'll do the same thing for the new Education Center and Veterinary Hospital. Uh, it's worth at least 
um, touching on the schedule associated with the uh, Education Center and Veterinary Hospital, uh, you will hear contractors talk about a phrase around substantial completion. Um, more so on the Education Center and Veterinary Hospital than the Penguin Project, it's actually going to take us four to six weeks once the contractor is substantially complete to complete our move in and be operation ready out of the new facility. Uh, additional, uh, different way to look at the timeline is through the milestones of the general contractor and uh, this essentially uh, corroborates both those, both those timelines. And with that, uh, we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions or comments? Uh, I'll jump in here. Um, I, I sit on that Cameron Park Zoo Commission, so I'm so happy to see this coming to fruition uh, now. And in the, I've also sat on council pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, but and, and this thing kind of came up right when COVID started, trying to put it all together, and it was uh, keeping everything on track. I, just, I, I, I applaud and commend staff because we went through just like the worst possible time in construction and estimates and timing and supply chain and all that uh, to really come up with a quality uh, project here. So uh, again, Bradley and your team, I, I, I commend you uh, for, for uh, staying the course and, and uh, making sure we got this uh, uh, completed. Uh, I also want to thank publicly uh, Gloria Young, who's a good friend of mine, and uh, just in the Schmidthauser family too. These people stepped up. Uh, to help uh, complete this project. And uh, I think it's wonderful that we're can, uh, commemorating some of these buildings to, to Glory and the, and the, and the Schmidhauser family. Um, one, you know, some of the early challenges I remember when we were trying to do some cost cutting, I was quoted in the trip, Matt Kyle, you'll, you'll appreciate this, this is a Waco trip quote when we were talking about it. I said, we don't want to do so much cost cutting that we end up with one penguin standing next to a Yeti cooler. <laughs> but, so this is, uh, this is not that. Uh, yeah. this, is looking, this is looking great. Um, I'm proud of, uh, of this. And part of the viability of a, of a zoo, obviously, is uh, bringing on new, new attractions and, and new uh, uh, things for people to see. That's what keeps it. I think we're, we're going to have an attendance bump. I'm confident. Uh, I'm happy how the, the local weight goings. This is, we talk about people coming into town and going to the zoo, but I think there's a pretty loyal local uh, uh, attendance here. People just like to go to the zoo and hang out. And I think this is going to be such a fantastic addition uh, and that we kind of spread out the original penguin with the, with the cats and uh, that I, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to uh, the opening uh, ceremonies there. And, really, and, and the people on the Zoological Society as well, appreciate their cooperation and, and hanging in there. Uh, Nancy Lacey, Christian Hack, uh, Jeff Holloman, Larry James, just a bunch of folks that have uh, uh, going shoulder to shoulder here and getting this thing done. So, uh, Director Wiley, I appreciate your work and you're coming in at a great time. This is going to be a fun project. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Brendan and Derek, I know that um, this has been a long um, project, but I think it's going to be really meaningful to our community. Echo what Councilmember Holmes said. Thanks to our whole city staff who's uh, worked to get this to this moment. Um, I can't wait to see the finished product. Uh, uh, finished product. It's going to be um, a really great day um, for our city um, and for our zoo lovers. So uh, thank you to everybody who's put their hand to the plow to get this here. Really appreciate you too and all the others who have worked hard on this one. Thanks, guys. Derek, I just got one question. Okay. The last big project that you shepherded, I think you brought your daughter in a fireman's oh, yeah. outfit. You know what? Are you planning for a penguin? I, I'm not going to disclose anything right okay. now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I maybe. say that just to say, a, 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 on a light note, a serious thanks to what you're what you're doing to get that project de delivered on Brendan's team. It's very well appreciated. Thanks. All right. Our, uh, our next presenter, it's not part of the work session, but I figured I'd take just a couple minutes to give Paul the floor um, to provide a briefing on our water conservation ordinance. It's posted 
on your agenda. He has uh, been noodling on this and wanted to present perhaps a another option for the council to consider. Paul? Thank you, Bradley. Uh, Mayor and Council, Lisa and I have been noodling uh, <laughs> this afternoon on this. And um, we um, certainly have been cognizant of the input that we've received from, from citizens and, and, and just in discussions generally about this. And um, what we'd like to um, propose for your consideration, not necessarily a vote tonight, unless that's your pleasure, of course, um, but something for uh, the council to think about. We think maybe the simplest way to approach this is to say that in our conservation part of our plan, we would go with three day a week watering instead of the two that's in the plan now. I think that meets um, most of the input that we've received and um, provides a transition because right now we don't have any restrictions at all. So the conservation plan would be three days a week and we'll um, provide those days um, to you at the next meeting. And then the other part is we would like to change stage one drought restrictions or stage one elevation from 455, which is about 72% full, up to 457, 80% full. And then at that point, it would shift to two day a week watering. So it would be part of our drought contingency plan. So we'd do three day a week, year round. If we go to stage one, which would be at 457 or 80% of the lake um, would be full, we would then transition to two day a week at that point. So I feel like that meets most of the comments that we've received. Um, provide some transition um, from seven days a week to three now and then if in fact we go to stage one when the lake's down 20 percent then we'll shift to two days at that point so that's something we'd like for you to consider again don't have to necessarily make that motion tonight if you're not comfortable with it um, if you are great um, and we'll bring back the exact days of watering at the next meeting we just want to make sure that we have one day and that's in that week in the time period it allows to, to balance the system, do maintenance and some other things when there's not as much demand on that day. Um, I'm glad you said that. Is, is, is it going to be too much pressure if you do get those two days back to back so you can, instead of the one day to restore the, the numbers? I mean, because I know that was one of the, the discussion points when we were doing two days because you have the opportunity to do the offset days for the different amount of the different citizens but would allow two solid days to restore is there can that happen or is that too much usage in that whatever one day that everybody's using um we if we can keep wednesday is a good day for us because the way our staffing works and our um, allows us to do more maintenance on wednesdays and so if we can keep Wednesdays open in that three day schedule, that will help us balance um, workload, do maintenance and other things um, on that day. And then once we go to two days, that will push free up more days in the week to do maintenance as we need to. So we think we can get there okay. with a Wednesday, okay. leaving Wednesday as a no watering day. Well, I just wanted no to make sure that, that everything that needed to be done from the, the right. staff perspective can be done. And if it needs to be two days, it needs to be two days. We think uh, if we go to three days, uh, no watering on Wednesdays, will uh, give us what we need to do the maintenance we need to do. Okay. Paul, can I ask, uh, still a feature of this, you, you've kind of outlined what would be the modification since this last was presented to us, but the period on every day from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. would still be a no watering time of day. Is that correct for evaporation reasons? That is correct. Yes, sir. Okay. That is correct. And the idea here is maybe give an extra day for watering so that we're not, it doesn't mirror kind of the drought restrictions that we just came out of year round, but we start getting everybody on a more conservation minded yes, sir. Uh, schedule. Is that the thought? <clears throat> yes, sir, it is. Um, right now in our conservation plan, we, we allow watering on every day. Um, and so we'd like to, we think three days is a, is a fair approach um, rather than the two days that were in the proposed ordinance so we make that change and by going into drought stage one when lake level hits 80 percent we begin getting in conservation mode at, at a bit earlier uh a or is earlier. that right is that fair yes, to say sir, uh, we do it, it would 
It would be a little bit earlier, uh, again, right now we're at 72% full or 455 feet of elevation. We'd go to 457 to that 80% number. You know, you'll be at 457, you'd see the lake would be about five foot low. So you'd start, citizens and others would start seeing that visible change in the lake. And, and the need to move to more stringent um, restrictions. And again, you know, irrigation watering, al although we all love um, flower beds and lawns and things to look great, you know, when the lake starts falling, you know, that's a good sign that we need to cut those back and, and be more conservative with our water usage um, outdoors. Thanks, Paul. Could you speak to <clears throat> um, what these restrictions would impose on uh, folks that have vegetable gardens and things like that in their their yards, uh, if they were to hand water uh, those to make sure that they could stand up to the test of the Texas summer heat. What would what would that look like for them? So the hand watering and Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong. The hand watering would be on the days that you were your watering days. Okay. Um, so if we were at three days a week, no. Mm -mm. If you hand water, you can water. I'm sorry, hand water can be any day, any time. Sorry. Time sprinkler systems. Mm -hmm. This is why. All right. <laughs> but to uh, state clearly for the record, hand watering. Uh, hand watering so would be allowed at all times. Five days, seven days, seven days a week. Let the word go forth. Yes, sir. That is correct. I'm sorry. Thank you. If you have a garden, you can water it by hand seven days a week. Yes, sir. Getting all yeses. Mm -hmm. Put it in the right. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, oh, my mom and anyway, the first restriction. Tell me, I tried. Same here. That's <laughs> a good fight. Uh, I, I appreciate. I don't. I don't think I'm ready to vote on it tonight. But I, just if we could get the red line and what all that looks like of the sure. of the ordinance itself. Because was do we? And for, let me back up. I appreciate staff kind of looking at this and getting feedback from maybe each of us and and uh, also constituents and citizens um, and synthesizing that into sort of a middle ground. Uh, I think, and, and, and I've been telling people, you went through uh, the, the president, CDM Smith, is that what it was? Last yes, time? Great presentation. Uh, talking about raising the lake level, you know, half a billion dollars. Okay, that's a nice one, but kind of expensive. Uh, the second one is the Brazos River Authority kind of getting permits permitting into that, which is a good idea too, but we're, we're told it's take three, four, five years to kind of get that going and it's, you'd have to do some other things as far as pumping and all that. Uh, so that one expensive and takes a lot of time. Uh, the third one, which I would like to is potable, using more non-potable where we're using potable, but even that has some purple pipe challenges and, and some infrastructure challenges. So I mean, the one that jumped out and staff, you know, appropriately highlighted it was conservation uh, let's uh, let's do what we can uh, to uh, which most other cities are doing as you pointed out so again the first round out of the box we got some feedback you're coming up with, with I think a nice uh, uh, solution here I, I like both of those concepts one question I have is the the uh, the change included some surge pricing right or some, uh, turbo pricing or whatever we call it on the, yes yes sir the Will that the stay drought, the way it is in the, in the next iteration? Okay. Yes, it will well, stay. As we see the draft of that, we'll okay. talk about it then. It, it increases as the stages progress. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Lisa. I really appreciate um, this is something that's really important um, that we get right. Water conservation is going to be really critical to our future. So look forward to voting on this, um, these measures. Um, we are committed to ensuring that we um, protect our water capacity for the years ahead. And um, I know that there's been some tinkering going on, but I feel really confident that this council is going to land and land in the right spot. Um, and we'll be able to move forward together to ensure that we have a great water supply for the years ahead. So thanks to staff for all their hard work on this matter. All right, I'll bring Jeremy back during the business session. Mayor, give us a few minutes for a break prior to business session. Great. Uh, are there any requests for future agenda items? No. If not, we will recess the work session and reconvene for a regular session for executive session as read into the record by the city secretary at 5.23 p.m. Mayor, uh, if I may, there's not going to be an executive session. At okay. All. Okay, then we will just recess till the business session.